plus just a reminder um, a reminder that like we do have that form i think it's bpquestions.monashdebaters.com if you've got any questions that come up that we'll answer at the end of the session like you no, know, like if you just want to know some stuff about bp or you've got a question about general bp strategy that's where me and Catherine will look at it at the end of the like my little presentation and then we'll just answer all of your questions i think we've already had one come in and it's quite a big one so look forward to that um other, other than that i think just i'm going to publicly mention that you should sign into the form to save peter's life that might not want to debate this form and tell peter you know if i want to watch a debate i want to debate whatever it is and he's really really proud of one joke question in there so uh, maybe just look at it because he's really proud of it um that's the takeaway that i'm getting from this okay so let's share screen Oh God, I did not post. Uh, no, not share. Why am I pressing share? Present. Today we will be talking about importance in debating. And let's, before we get started, define some jargon that I'll probably be using throughout this debate. So importance, let's say, for the context of this like speech or presentation, is just going to be discussing the latter half of an argument. I believe an argument breaks down fundamentally into two things. First is when you prove like how the argument is true, right? Like you step out, this is how an actor sees the motion. This is what they do. Like once you implement this policy, this is how they then act. And that will result in consequence X. Importance is about trying to make that consequence X like as important to debate as possible. So, you know, if the consequence is that thousands of people are going to die, Maybe perhaps you don't need to spend as much time on it. But if the consequence is that, say, for example, let's say some people will not overdose from drugs at the cost of other people having easier access to drugs, then you need to be starting to talk about like why it's more important for you to be able to stop people from overdosing on drugs than it might be for like at the trade-off of other people being able to consume some drugs. To that end, we're going to we break down importance, or at least I sort of break down importance into impacting and weighting. And these are the terms that adjudicators tend to like throwing around. This isn't like an official dictionary definition. Debaters haven't really got that. We probably should because no, but yeah, this is just sort of how I see the terms as they've been used and how I sort of define them. Impacting then is the specific act of like, this is the consequence. This is who they will affect. This is like how it'll play out. This is, for example, it'll be like, this is, we will save lives because people are no longer overdosing on drugs. We will uh, say, allow LGBT movements to better access political change and be able to get the legislation that they need on board. We will be able to save climate change. We'll be able to stop like all of the polluting. All of these are the things that you might consider impacts that result from an argument that you have made, right? And you have to build up with the logical links of the mechanisms to reach that. Waiting then is the question of how should an adjudicator value this argument? Because obviously in very high level rooms and even in low level rooms, what occurs is that often what happens is a team will go, I've proven to you that by doing this, we will save the lemurs. But on the other side, some team has proven, well, yeah, maybe you save the lemurs, but it's much more important that we save the otters. And I've proven on our side that we save the otters. Who should I care about more? Do we care about saving the lemurs or do we care about saving the otters? And so if you leave it to like the adjudicator to just do it by themselves at the end of the debate, it's quite dangerous for you as a debater, right? Because you're not quite sure like how they're going to read it. Maybe you've got a, like a pretty good idea because like, you know, they love otters or something. That's just like not exactly how you want to be approaching the debate. So waiting then is how specifically you will evaluate your argument to say, oh, okay, this is why otters outweigh the importance of lemurs. I just used like the weirdest example ever. Why am I thinking about orders and leaders? Why is this important? And why is it particularly important in BP? BP, um, I'm getting comment. Let's hit chat window up. <laughs> All right. Um, by the way, like if you have any questions that pop up, like as I'm speaking, like just relevant to a particular slide or something, just throw it into the chat message or like turn on your mic. But note that if you turn on your mic, you might get recorded, that sort of stuff. So why is B, why is importance and like uh, important that is yeah anyways bp is a debate style where importance is much more important god i should stop saying that than 3v3 because like in 3v3 it's reasonably expected that like if your team is making an argument that's part of the case and that's part of how you should care about it but in bp 
Like you need to not only establish that you are winning important arguments, you also need to establish that like your arguments are the like biggest chunk of this debate. Your arguments are either outweighing your closing or outweighing your opening. So you always need to be considering your arguments. And as, as I sort of note in the slides, this is something that you have to consider when you're literally choosing which arguments to run, or from opening and closing. If you're opening, you need to be actively thinking about importance in order to determine we're going to run points about these, but these are going to be the most critical issues of the debate. And at closing, you need to be evaluating how well your opening is doing on that so that you're able to be like either stepping up and like claiming the bits that are important that you think they forgot, or being able to just say like, okay, we're, we're left with like these five rubbish arguments. How do we make them more important than the openings arguments that have just been made? And all the other stuff, right? Like you don't need to necessarily respond to every argument. You have to respond to the important ones. It's given that you have lots of li like very limited time in a BP setting, particularly taking POIs. And finally, I mentioned importance as just a way to sort of work around like arguments that you can't beat on a more logical level. That is to say, sometimes like, yeah, I can't, let's go back to lemurs and otters. I can't prove that you won't save the otters, but all I have to do in order to beat that argument is prove that saving lemurs is the more important consideration in this debate. And therefore, even if I can't stop you from proving that you will save otters, I have won the more critical and important issue. So using weighting and understanding weighting is just, I think, extremely important in a debate. And for an example of where that actually played out, and I'm going to be using a lot, I'll try and use a lot of examples from my own debating career, mostly because I was too lazy to go research YouTube ones and show you actual good examples. A way that I remember a debate where I specifically was able to win exactly using weighting was back in the early days of like when Biden versus like Bernie Sanders as who should be the Democratic primary candidate for the presidential race until down 20 was an actual consideration before Bernie dropped out. We had that classic debate. Would you go Bernie or would you go Biden? And we just got up and said, like at closing, here are all the reasons that Biden is more electable. And here are all the reasons why electability outweighs everything else that had been talking about debate. But previously that debate had been talking about who would pass the policy that would better serve Americans. Previously that debate had been talking about like personalities of like Biden versus uh, Bernie once they actually got in power. We stepped up and we said, no, those things don't matter. It's so much more important for you to be able to actually win the election. Here are the reasons that your election is in jeopardy because of Trump. This was before he was even like dismantling the post office. And here's why, therefore, the most important thing you need to consider adjudicator is not the question of what policy they'll pass, but who is most electable. And by doing that, we were able to set the grounds of, of the debate in our terms. And by do, like then passing arguments that were relevant, we were able to win. And I would say largely credit that win in that round from closing, largely because we were able to step up and do that explicit weighting. And if you don't, and like, therefore, I hope you can sort of see how like explicit weighting by itself and understanding importance and understanding what you find as important in the debate is incredibly useful. Early days, by the way, Boris, refers to the fact that I just feel like before quarantine and after quarantine are completely different years. So when should you be considering importance? And I'm highlighting prep time because Let's face it, I say that like understanding importance is useful in an in like in explicitly a part of your speech, right? Like sometimes it's useful to just be like, we are more important because we talk about more people, X, Y, Z, we hurt the least people, or like we're most likely to occur, that sort of thing. And this, this is why we are outweighing our opening, and this is why we're outweighing closing opposition, all of that stuff. But you don't need to do that if your argument just is the most important thing or just is particularly relevant right you don't need to talk about like why the deaths and genocides of millions might be something that's particularly important or for a debate where say for example being able to achieve the greatest and fastest change for a certain minority group is like going to be the issue and everybody's going to discuss that issue you don't actually need to step out why because you've won the issue that is the most critical issue in the debate you've won you're like you're outweighing everybody else right so this is like one Something you should definitely be considering both from opening and closing. And I flagged earlier, in opening, you need to be thinking about like how important your arguments are so that you're able to choose what the most important arguments are. So you're able to bring it out from prime minister, from deputy prime minister if need be, but like these are the things that the debate will center around. These are the things that will be most important to the debate. And so we're going to be talking about them and therefore closing is going to have a hell of a rough time to steal anything better than us. But also, 
I think that you should also be paying and weighing importance as you're like doing the debate, right? As people present things, as your opening present things, consider how important you think that their material is. Weigh that against the material that you might be bringing out from closing and try and make sure that like you've got something prepared for that. If your opposition is talking about different arguments, if your opposition is presenting certain arguments, think about not only how are you going to rebut them, but also how important they are to debate to determine whether or not you need to respond to them. And if you need to respond to them, prioritize the ones that you think are most important. Let's move on. I'm going to present to you a simplified model of how to think about impacting and waiting on three ideas, breadth, depth, and probability. This is obviously simplified. There are actually quite a numerous number of ways that you're able to think about how you might impact on something. Something that I haven't mentioned here, for example, is that you might be able to impact something or make important something just on the more relevance to the topic. So for example, uh, back at Worlds, there was a motion like we would ban the Olympics. My team came in at closing and we just ran, whereas opening had been basically doing stuff that was broadly applicable to many, many sporting events. We told you here are specifically the things that the Olympics stands for. Here are specifically the harms that result of the Olympics. Therefore, these are the things that are more important to consider about in the debate when we want to evaluate whether or not we should ban them. So like, this is a bit of a simplified model. It doesn't account for certain things, but I think breadth, depth, and probability are the things that most likely you're naturally impacting it, and obviously going to be the more like 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 most levels of impacting and most levels of importance analysis comes under. So let's break each of them down. First, breadth of impact. I think this is fairly intuitive in that basically all of this talks about is just how many people will your argument affect, right? Like. If an uh, argument affects a thousand people and another argument affects 10,000 people, you probably should prefer the argument that affects 10,000 people. And adjudicators should probably prioritize like as winning the arguments that would like get you more harms to more people or more benefits to more people. And the only thing I'd mention in addition to that is to make sure to consider like what are known as multiplier effects. And these are basically sometimes like by affecting like one person, that one person can then affect say multiple people or that like I think the example given there is like like if you if you have something that will directly affect teachers and like politicians that might mean that like because politicians pass policy and teachers teach students that would mean that whatever has affected them broadly affects large swathes of society and by doing so that will help you be able to truly capture the scale of the number of people that you're affecting. And I think also that like, as mentioned, if you're going to be comparing weighting, this is also quite simple, right? Because all you're doing is you're just saying, we have bigger numbers, here's why we have bigger numbers. And therefore, it's fairly intuitive why those bigger numbers would mean that we are winning the debate in some way. So I think that this is something that is like, you will see in basically every debate that like I can think of. To some extent, you'll be talking about how many people your policies are affecting and how many people, um, therefore, you should be caring about. Next thing that you should think about when you think about how to make something important is how the depth of impact or to what extent someone is affected by the argument. Because obviously if I can prove to you that like on the positive side, we're going to prevent people dying, but all you can prove on the negative side is that like maybe somebody will get a paper cut. These analogies are getting very hyperbolic very quickly, but you'll obviously then prefer the side that is like trying to tell you about something more deeply. And I mentioned here is that like, this is where you start to see interplay between the three levels of like, um, how you weight and impact things, right? Because sometimes like what will happen is that you might make like five people very much worse off. You might kill five people. And that will come at the cost of like say 10 people being mildly inconvenienced or maybe even majorly inconvenienced. And then all of the debating then comes down to either one team getting up and being like, it's bad for you to like majorly inconvenience 10 people to try and save the deaths of five people. Or like you get up and you say, no, actually it's more preferable that we save the lives of five people if we majorly impact 10 people. So this is like, being aware of this and being how you interplay it is quite important. I think the thing that I want you to be aware of is that often a trap that I see debaters fall into is to just say like, ooh, these are the most vulnerable stakeholders in this debate. We are caring about them the most. Therefore, we are impacting or we are most important in this debate. I think that that's not enough in order to actually prove importance. I think that you have to actually step out to like an adjudicator, 
One, why that person is more like particularly vulnerable in this space. But secondly, why then therefore that means that they need to be catered for the most in this debate. So that means you have to add in analysis about say, like why without this, these people would have no access to certain things or why like, because they have been deprived of like say economic opportunity. That means that they have little ability to redress a lot of the harms as compared to a rich person who might be able to like mitigate a lot of the harms by say like buying, like buying, buying Uber Eats where a normal person has to go out and like go out and might potentially get affected by the pandemic, that sort of stuff. So it's not really enough to just identify that there is a most vulnerable. And it's not really enough to just say like, this group has been historically oppressed and they're really vulnerable. You have to step out why they are particularly vulnerable, but also why they're particularly important in this debate. And I say that where depth of impact is likely to be really, really important is if you see a debate about social justice, because often these will just be debates about like purity versus broadness type situations where you argue for, say for perhaps like this particular group has been so culturally oppressed or well, this particular group faces these extreme harms if like they're not catered for and we're not looked out for in society. That's why we need to protect them or that's why we need to like advocate for issues, even if it means pissing off the majority or even if it means forgetting certain people in this debate because the majority of people will never acknowledge their voices. And also you see that often in criminal justice when like you talk about victims or you talk about rehabilitation, you talk about punishment, but you're talking about like say for example, how much a victim will be hurt by a thing versus how much will a, a criminal benefit from having less punishment and more rehabilitative focus like criminal justice systems, you're often talking about criminal justice systems in a way that is heavily examining the depth of impact. Final thing then to think about in when you want to try and consider how important an argument is, is likelihood or probability, which is, again, does what it says on the tin. It's how likely something is going to occur. And I think that this builds off how well you've done the mechanisms, right? The first half of your argument, or like, not like, Okay, the, the, the first half of your argument where you stepped out, like, you know, this is why our things are true. This is like why us implementing this policy will result in outcome X. It's, it's basically going to be built on that, but I've raised it as a way for you to be able to be aware of that sometimes you can play around with it, right? But sometimes you might make arguments, like here are the reasons why there might be like a 10% chance that North Korea will just nuke the world. And we say that that's awful, right? We say that even if it's not that likely, the fact that you're playing with something so dangerous, the fact that you're operating with a probability that, or doing a motion that might result in us ending in the nuclear apocalypse, the fact of the matter is, is that even if it's like, very quite unlikely. The damage or potential cause or potential result of it is so high that like we need to outweigh it. But also secondarily, you can quite often use this as like a stepping stone to be able to counter other arguments or like as a specific weighting metric. Because sometimes you might be like, oh, our opening has talked about quite an unlikely situation. So us at closing, we're we'll talking about the more likely issue X, Y, and Z in this debate, or maybe they'll be like, well, negative may have proved an outcome and may have proved that like it might affect somebody, but we're not focused on that. We're focused on what will 100% of the time occur for like 100% of the people when the second you implement this motion. Therefore, you probably should prioritize our material more than you prioritize anything else. And I say that this likelihood analysis becomes particularly important in international relations. I say that because oftentimes what an international relation round will come down to, particularly sort of the invasion or like war type rounds, it's just going to be how an actor acts and like how likely it is they'll respond in a certain way to certain things. So secondarily, I say that these often occur in like the media rounds or like the this, somebody watches a film, like how should we react to it? Should we ban certain media? Or like we prefer certain types of media that depict people in certain ways. Because oftentimes media is hard to quantify like how exactly a human will react to say watching a show such as 13 Reasons Why. And your goal is to just present why it's likely that they're going to like take it in a bad way or why it's likely that they're going to be maybe even more depressed rather than like, or even more like, thoughts of suicide would be even more prevalent after watching a badly done show that talks about suicide badly, such as 13 Reasons Why. Finally, like, yeah, basically, as I mentioned, if, if, if you recognize that like your mechanisms are a bit difficult, then quite often you should look for how you're proving likelihoods and quite often this will be like how you get around it. Let's tie it all together. All three of these things I note should be relevant and present in all of your arguments 
to some capacity, right? You're obviously going to be talking about likelihood to some capacity, but you have to build up why an outcome is likely for your mechanisms. You're obviously going to try and talk about to some level, how many people this affects, and you obviously will naturally try and talk about what level of effect that they're like being affected by, right? Like I think, uh, actually I didn't, probably didn't need to explicitly tell you this, but I think the reason that I want to tell you this is that it's important to take that like subconscious level that you've been doing with all your arguments and make it explicit so that you are aware of the strategies that you can use to fight people into the grounds of debates. Because also, and to be aware of it as you craft your argument, because the first level is that if you are aware that like say a thing is unlikely, you're aware that like like you pushing for this idea that nuclear Armageddon might be a potential outcome of you pissing off North Korea, but that's not particularly likely, then you will include the lines that such as that tell you about like, oh, adjudicator, the way you should value this, the way you should view this as important is not just on like whether or not it will actually occur, but rather can we put a pot, like can we allow ourselves to play the Russian roulette game that might let it occur? Or that like, if you know that like your argument isn't affecting that many people, then you need to put more effort into making sure that you've got a really high level of depth. You've got a really high level of like how much they'll affect the person. You put in a lot of emotive words about like how troubled a person be or like, put in a lot of emotive words about why these people have been so neglected and so why, why even at the cost of majority, you might have to like prioritize the minority. And so I think that like one, if you're struggling to make up arguments or you're struggling to make important your arguments, it is useful often to just refer back to this, right? To just go back to this list and go, have I necessarily talked about insufficient detail why something matters? Or have I necessarily talked about like insufficient detail uh, how 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 many people it's affected, or how much depth, uh, how much breadth, how much depth it does, or have I even just done my mechanism well enough, or you explicitly need to talk about the likelihoods? But second, um, I think that what you should keep in mind is that I obviously then sometimes I tell people you need to weight your arguments more in like feedback as an adjudicator, and the reason I'm telling them that is because oftentimes and particularly as closing, but to an extent at opening you just need to do it explicitly because otherwise your adjudicator is just left there and they'll do it by themselves and that's a gamble you can't take but as an adjudicator i hate it when a team leaves anything ambiguous when they leave something ambiguous i'm just like okay i i, I lean towards this argument or i might lean against it but I can't say why, and I can't point to what you said in your speech to why. So I have to be triple sure that I'm not reading into the debate. I have to be triple an extra layer of analysis as to like what an average reasonable person would see it. Whereas if you just got up and said like blatantly, this is more important. This is why you should care about it. This is why us winning this argument has resulted in us winning the debate over our opening and definitely over our opposition sides. Then this is how you're able to just one like nullify or like my ability to be like, well, I don't know if I can wait at that at that higher, or secondarily like, um, like just make sure that you are talking about the right things at the right time. I think this is how I think about importance, and this is like, and I hopefully those three ideas are how like you're able to help help you a little bit in crafting. A note on then on manner. I think if you want to make something important. You want need to use tangible, concrete examples, and you need to make use of your tone. What I mean is, is that oftentimes what debaters do is they debate in the abstract. They say things such as like, this will result in certain people not being able to access food, and that'll mean that like, X percent, like it's all very highbrow or very analytical. And to an extent that may be part of your manner that might work for you. I prefer things when things get down into the nitty gritty, right? I prefer to say, a human, when they look at, say, the gruesome deaths of an animal on a TV screen, tell you, like, will react more viscerally, will be more, like, more inclined to listen to the words that follow after that tell them you shouldn't eat animals than they are if you just try and present the idea that, like, say, uh, uh, you shouldn't eat animals because of environmental concerns. And that is why that we would rather show people gory pictures of animals than we would show them anything else. I prefer it when a team goes, this will result in the deaths of millions than when they say, like, Things such as like this will result, uh, uh, like they, they, they try and like make high brows, like this may potentially result in the suffering of like uh, quite a number of people, like uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? I think that like 
to the extent that you ha are able to like bring it to my level to to make it like really realistic to step out like a equals z a equals b equals c which leads on to z and then bring it in from the perspective of an average person right an average person will look at facebook they'll see this policy in motion they'll see uh say for example facebook banning all of these people this is how they will react to facebook banning all of the conservative politicians this is what they'll feel this is how they will react this is who they'll tweet to this is who they'll talk to this is how they'll talk about the issue you're able to one more concretely describe to me how your things have occurred which is good for your mechanism but also more concretely make in my mind like ah i see now it's super important now that we fix this second thing on manner is to just make use of your tone right just make make serious the things that are serious make a conscious effort to like put gravitas into the situation or maybe even just make light of the things that need to be making light of but just keeping an eye on what your manner is doing and it's sort of like having a reason for your doing and i think as i mentioned like i will note in the slides i think this is why points that come in at six minutes 30 rarely stick because oftentimes you let your manners slip in those points at six minutes 30. oftentimes you're like oh and uh, I, uh yeah i'll just try and fit in this point about like six minutes 30 and i'll talk about it really quickly and it'll just sort of like let me rush through it and blah 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 and then okay here that's why i'm very proud to propose and just like not very convincing right whereas if you just instead said like Okay, and finally, the most important issue, like one of the most important issues today is here, give me a solid 30 seconds, make it really serious, don't let on, like make it almost that you are planned to have this at six minutes, six minutes 30, don't let on that like you've badly calculated your timing sheets, and you've badly like calculated how you were doing in terms of time, you, that POI took way too long, don't let any of that on. Fake it, fake it, make it that you're really authoritative, make that like you're really, really clear. And hopefully what that'll do is that at the very minimum, it'll mean that your adjudicator, rather than thinking subconsciously in their brain, oh, um, this isn't particularly important, they're rushing through it. I don't need to note it down. I don't need to take it down in particularly high levels of detail. At the very minimum, it'll force them to focus, force them to pay attention. But secondarily, and on note on manners, you can definitely use it to just make certain things stick in their mind, right? Like if you need them to keyword the idea of equality, then you just maybe put a bit more emphasis on equality. That'll allow you to allow, put a level of importance onto it. Let's move on. I think this is the maybe the second last slide. I don't know. Um, principal arguments. I bring this out as a specific like extra addition to weighting because the reason that principal arguments are hard is because the weighting and importance of them is extremely difficult. And the reason that they're difficult is mostly because the depth of impact is relatively low. So what I mean is, is that it's fairly obvious when somebody has a physical harm or a certain emotional harm or that sort of thing. Like, like, like why, or like uh, they'll be disadvantaged or that certain things won't be able to access to them. Like, like it's fairly intuitive why that's a harm. But principal arguments play around that zone, right? I think the principal arguments are the arguments that is like, Oh, we should never hand. Uh, we should never brokerage a two two state solution to the Israel Palestine thing, be, uh, because Palestine principally deserves that bit of land and every Palestinian principally holds that fear or that like we should never say allow the resource mining of the moon because principally like uh that the moon is very culturally important and the moon is like something that we shouldn't allow like to be commercialized and shouldn't allow capitalism to get its grubby paws on I think though that if you think about it actually all of these things are just arguing for an impact that just isn't as physical as you would normally make it. And therefore your job is to just make that emotional impact as clear as possible, right? Like the, like the emotional impact that a human will feel when they look up at the moon and see that rather than like the beautiful moon that we've been writing about in poetry and talking about and almost deifying for thousands and thousands of millennia and instead, is like just another way that BP, another bit of rock that BP like mines and another crater created that is only like a way to get oil is a significant emotional harm, right? And it is something that maybe an adjudicator would feel. Like you just have to, one, step out like to your adjudicator, like how this is an emotional, or like how this is like a principle level harm. Like to the extent that you're able to say like, this is how you'll feel. This is how people feel. But the second thing to do when you're trying to impact principal arguments or make important principal arguments is just use a bunch and a bunch of real life comparisons and real life examples. I remember a debate where we were talking about like how sovereignty is important. 
And the way that I try to impact sovereignty is that I talk to a lot of people about how how important sovereignty is and the way that we see that sovereignty is important. We see that like when Hong Kongers are willing to basically defend a murderer from being extradited to Taiwan at the cost of their sovereignty, that it probably is quite an important thing in this debate. We see that when people are willing to fight and die for sovereignty sometimes, that sovereignty is something that if you impugn upon can never be like like can never be lightly brushed off oil. Like the sovereignty in and of itself is something that people are willing to die for. Sovereignty in and of itself is something that people are willing to get out and protest for. Therefore, if you're, you're like damaging sovereignty, you can't just lightly brush it away with claims of, ah, but we'll get you practical benefits. Ah, but we'll give you some extra level of comfort. Because people don't value things like that. People don't value the practical things in that way when they have a principle that they might defend. And that's how I think you're able to just take a principle argument, which originally starts as like, ooh, this is how people are feeling, right? This is how people are thinking about an issue. And just make it something that the adjudicator goes like, yeah, I agree with that. I agree that if I had my like sovereignty violated, I might myself try and fight for my country. Or if I agree that like I myself hold artistic integrity as something particularly important to the artists that I hold value, this is why I might like want to try and protect it. And that's why I mentioned that you should do something that's very simple and intuitive. Your adjudicator should be able to instantly get why you're talking about this principle and use examples. Use examples wherever you can. Make analogies. Make that comparison to the real world. This is how you turn like that in, uh, principle argument, which like you know it isn't it isn't talking about an impact that you can easily say. You're not talking about like oh this will result in five people dead and blah blah blah. This is how you turn it into something that has just as much of an impact, has just as much of like a real world effect. I think we'll finish this off with a bit of practice. I'm going to now open the floor. You guys' ideas. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll probably, I'll just say it like we'll cut this bit out of the video from now on, um, except and then we'll, I don't know, we'll cut to the QA bits. So I want all of you, Catherine will now step in to do a bit of QA. I'll also be here to answer any questions if you want to direct them. Again, go to bpquestions.monashdebaters.com if you've got any questions. I think we've already had one come in earlier today. Catherine, would you mind telling us what that was? Um, firstly, I just have a few more comments. <laughs> <laughs> to add in relation to weighing and impacting. Um, hopefully I'll make Brilliant. it quite simple so that you guys uh, can be um, more engaged in the, like, the question aspect. So I feel like so a lot of that stuff was really, really excellent and you guys should definitely take that on board in terms of how to use rhetoric and how to use impacting to prove the importance of your arguments. I think the important thing to note is that there are two types of importance, I think. So firstly, there is importance in the sense of what is internal to your argument or why your argument is intrinsically important and like why it affects this many people uh, or it has this amount of depth or breadth of impact, etc. But there is also external importance in the sense of how your argument is situated in relation to every other argument. And rhetoric does go a really, really long way and helps there a lot, but it also relies on engagement with what they're weighing against you. So in that sense, um, you might have to engage with a lot more strategies in relation to how you balance those two or how you make the size of their benefit something that's much smaller and how you win the way up in a way that you can like make um, the way up much clearer between the sides. Because I think um, the thing to remember is that these things operate in a degree, right? So for, ex for instance, someone might be arguing that um, population growth is really, really important. We need to incentivize that. Um, and I think there was like a topic in relation to like, Tra trading child permits or something like that. Um, but the, the other side is arguing something like bodily autonomy. And they're obviously very different things. And in different contexts, those different concepts go different ways. So debating is kind of an exercise in degree in the sense of where should you draw the threshold in this particular instance and not whether this thing is important within a vacuum. Because yes, bodily autonomy is good as a concept, but obviously it may be more important in some instances than other instances. And in some particular policies, it may be more relevant than other policies and you need to be able to navigate the matrix of how it operates in relation to that particular policy. So at the end of the day, a lot of it is also about specificity or finding things or drawing facts out about the particular motion that gives rise to a certain iteration of what Wang looks like. That being said, a couple of thoughts on how to do like the external weighing. Firstly, it's to mitigate the things you cannot win. Um, and if these are things like you quite clearly can't win or you like you do that thinking beforehand and you're like, I acknowledge that this is something that's particularly difficult to win. So, for instance, taking James's uh, nuclear weapons example, 
Um, it's probably like the case that it is, it is comparatively less likely that like nuclear waste will, for instance, um, you, like you result in some, something of like a nuclear explosion or nuclear Armageddon, right? It's, it's comparatively unlikely compared to some of like the security concerns and things like that. But there are ways you can mitigate that so it's easier to win the way up. So for instance, you point to reasons why, although it's probably less likely comparatively, it's like more likely than you think it is, like relative to where they're portraying it to be. For instance, Cuban Missile Crisis, close calls in the Soviet Union era, like the fact that people are just dumb and like presidents can press buttons and that's probably bad. Um, and those kinds of reasons just narrow the margin. So it's easier to win the way up when you're trying to emphasize all of the things that are bad about nuclear Armageddon, but also the likelihood of it occurring, even though it's comparatively less likely, is actually much narrower than they think it is, which makes that much easier to win. So that's the first one. Um, and obviously corresponding to that is being able to amplify margins on everything you can win, which is everything that James told you, but you do that in conjunction with like narrowing the things that they are trying to win on so that you can kind of make the way up more easy for you. Uh, the second way you can do this is you can collapse the debate in a way. So for instance, you can point to reasons why things happen anyway. And this happens a lot, for instance, um, in particularly because like sometimes debates like to operate in a vacuum, but obviously there are a lot of other extrinsic factors operating on what the actual motion is talking about. So for instance, um, a way you can mitigate this and probably not to like the maximal effect, but one example of this in relation to the, uh, the, to the motion that we just talked about in relation to like class struggle, there are other mechanisms to agitate for class struggle. So for instance, there are mechanisms um, such as like unionization or like broader class movements that target like misconduct by the elites and things like that. But what is exclusive about identity based movements is that they particularly address issues that are not identified through other means. So for instance, issues of like racial police brutality or issues of sexual assault are things that no other movement necessarily focuses on and if your identity based movement turns into a class based movement then you like who is really getting all of those kinds of things or who is progressing those kinds of goals and in that sense it's kind of like you get an exclusive benefit whereas they get a benefit that may be significant but you can get it a lot of other ways and as such, you can outweigh theirs because you are the exclusive way to get this particular benefit this, for this particular uh, group of people, and they have no other means of attaining that benefit. Um, and I think the third then is also just like, don't be afraid to escape the paradigm that's been set up. So it's very easy to be like a utilitarian and fall into a numbers game of like, no, you have 70 people and we have 20 like that kind of thing. Um, but I think that the the better way to sometimes approach these kinds of issues is when you get caught in a deadlock about numbers and no one's really clear on where the deadlock lies. So this happens a lot with voting. It's just like, oh, but there's like more, more progressive voters on the left. Oh no, but there's moderate voters, but they'll like turn out anyway and this kind of thing. Um, it can sometimes be useful to break out of that deadlock by explaining why potentially it is not purely the numbers game that matters. So for instance, this in electoral debates, a lot of this happens around, for example, for example, like swing states. So um, like you escape the paradigm of it being a pure numbers game by saying, um, no, particular states matter more than others because of the way that the electoral college works. And you explain the way the electoral college works. You explain why voters in the Midwest matter a lot, or voters in Ohio matter a lot because of the way the electoral college works. And therefore we need to appeal to moderate voters more because they have more of a sway and see how that kind of like navigates yourself out of that gridlock that you set up in relation to the pure numbers game of what is more utilitarian or not. So adding different dimensions to it and being able to make like those observations that add those dimensions and say, no, this happens through other means and therefore this is what the exclusive benefit of our side is, or no, this is not the paradigm we should operate under because of X and X, like Y reasons, are ways you can kind of escape that sort of very gridlock style weighing that's difficult to get out of. Cool. Um, so those are just some thoughts on external weighing. I'm gonna go through some questions now. Um, the first question is, go over how to structure and do a whip speech. Whip speeches are great. Um, I think that the good thing about whip speeches also is that like in many ways they can require less thought than how to structure a 3v3 speech because the easiest, easiest iteration of how you put this is why we beat every other team, <laughs> why we beat OG, why we beat like CG and CO. And obviously that gets a bit more complicated, but that's like the very, very basic one line answer to that question. Um, to get to the more complicated parts, I think the first thing you need to consider is the way that you prioritize that. So for instance, if OG and CG are advancing a similar argument, maybe you want to address them in one go, 
Or potentially, if you think that one team is a lot stronger than the other, you might want to dedicate a lot more time to them. So for instance, maybe you are like um, CO and you think that the entire gov bench was really weak, but you think that your opening was really, really good. So in that instance, you don't want to have it be an equal split because you want to spend more time dedicated to trying to win the, over the team that you think will, like it has the best chance of winning. So if you think that like gov is pretty much dead, then you're kind of like, okay, so what is the most strategic thing you can do at this point in the debate as a whip? And that's probably spending more time being like, why our material is more important than our openings and setting up particularly and precisely the exact reasons why you get up over your opening. Um, other thoughts on that is in particular in relation to whip speeches. And I think this is the dynamic of BP that's not really present in 3v3. Um, which is the extension dynamic, because obviously you need to use your extension as a framing mechanism for your whip speech, because your whip speech is not just about rebuttal. Um, and I think that the trap is that sometimes you can treat like BP as a rebuttal game when it's really very different and it's much more about weighing and it's much more about importance because everyone has like less time to speak uh, and less time to offer their contribution. So their contribution has to be really solid and really important. And I think in that context, when you respond to things as a whip, you are not just responding to them on the basis of this is wrong, but also particularly using every opportunity to push your material forward. So for instance, instead of responding to something that OG says with like maybe a material that is derivative of your opening or a response that your opening has already given, even though that might be correct, it might not be the most strategic because you want to highlight what your contribution to the debate is and you want to highlight why your extension is most important. So even by saying things like, our opening provided like the like the, the first sentence essentially of this response but we give you like the reason why this is the case we give you the particular stakeholder group that is important or we give you like the mechanism for why this actually works um can extend on that much more uh, and build into the case that you are bringing out at closing so those kinds of things uh, are basically just generally how I set it out. It's like a it's a strategy game I'd say um you're, you're addressing why you get up over each different team and you can do it in, you can do it by issue or you can do it as simple as just by teams um, and you argue why your extension is what should win you the debate through the responses and through the frame do you have anything to add to that James I do a little bit um, I think all of that is brilliant um, the thing I would like to add is that this is why whip and member communication is extremely extremely important because if you as a whip don't know what your member is going to be trying to do in extension, you can't start preparing the responses to say, like, your close, the closing government that you're facing down, or you can't start preparing the reasons for why you're going to outweigh your opening half. If you, can't, if you just don't know, like, what arguments are we bringing? So exiting prep time, you should both be on the exact same page. What are the possible strategies that we're going to go with? How we're going to outweigh those strategies? If opening takes these strategies, then we're going to be going with these arguments and why these arguments are more important. And also to like in the middle of debate, and it's been quite difficult for me at least on the online format, just making sure you're communicating both ways, right? This is pressure on members, speeches and pressure on whips to both just be very active in communication. And when, before the member gets up to speak, the whip should know, we are going to be arguing about these things. And in that time, they should be able to, like, instead of having to write down what the members saying to try and figure out how they're going to do their speech, they should just be able to be like, okay, I know what the member's going to say. I'm just going to focus on how I'm going to use all this to beat the other team. Wonderful. Um, and if anyone wants further resources on this, uh, James recommends the uh, video by the current non-redacted best speaker of the world. <laughs> um, uh, and you can like Google like whip speeches, Arthur Mishra, or some version of whip speeches like online. Um, there are plenty of videos on YouTube in relation to it. Uh, I'm pretty sure like the European debate training platform also puts out um, other videos in relation to that. I think, um, yeah, some other very good debaters or much better than me have had thoughts on this. Cool. Uh, the second question that we had was, um, so I'm worried that the team as my closing is much more skilled than me. How should I use weighing or other things to try and get ahead of them before they give their extension? Cool. Um, so I have a few thoughts on this. I think um, the first thing I would say is sometimes the most important thing at opening is not to try and pull some like crazy mental gymnastics or complexity. Sometimes the easiest thing to do could just be like giving a very clear and very like solid conception of the case. So 
um, the, the advantage that you have at opening is choice because you can basically run anything on either side and not have it nabbed by closing. But it's sometimes I think that this is a good exercise um, in firstly, identifying the most important thing very, very clearly. And secondly, doing that particular thing in depth. So for instance, it might be useful to pick something that's narrower and do it more thoroughly and better because often you can see closing teams come in and be like, oh, you know, they said this, but they didn't give the mechanism or the reasons or the structural reasons. We will supplement all of those things. So by providing every link in a case very strongly at opening, it means that it's much harder for your closing to do that and much harder for your closing to be like, here is a gap that they left and let me go into it. So I think that th the opening is very much an exercise in making sure that each component of your case is fairly airtight. So that means like thinking through and explicitly talking about how to make your mechanisms very strong and very like complete in how they approach the issue. Um, clearly identifying who you care about and why they are important and explaining why they are important from the very beginning. So doing that weighing that James talked to you about before. Um, and making sure to justify each leg of it. So like, what, what is the context of this? What is like the, the characterization that I'm going to use here? What is the mechanism and what are the particular impacts that, um, I'm, that this will result in? And then how do we weigh that against other things? Um, and making sure you do all of that can sometimes be very, very helpful. Because like, I feel like at that point, um, your closing can pull a lot of tricks, but it's very hard to kind of just get over a very clean and very clear opening. So actually going back to the basics can be like pretty helpful, especially um, as opening and especially if you're concerned about um, closing tricks. James? Yeah, I've got nothing much more to add to that. Just if you consider that you've run, you've picked the most important arguments and you consider that you're going to do that and it's good details you can, then I think that's just the best you can do, right? Like, and if they can do it better than you, well, yes, I think sometimes it's just a bit unfortunate, but you can only do the best that you can. So don't worry about it. Don't let it stress you out. Does anyone else have any more questions? Taking hands. Tristan? Um, yeah. Have you ever actually, like, uh, or closing or, um, or just ever really as anyone, like, sort of been in a, a BP debate and gone, like, oh, first is, you know, impossible, we'll just try to get over second and actually aim for second? Or is this just sort of like a hypothetical situation that people always say, like, theoretically you can do, but then no one ever actually does it? done it I feel like I've done it <laughs> I mean sometimes you're just in a room and you're just like you know these people are pretty scary and intimidating or um you or you like maybe clearly just have an opening that like basically covers most of what you think um is was going to be your case or something like that um and then you kind of have to play more of a strategic game and I think it's a very valid strategy but also um, I think it's also something that's good to judge on like the substance of the debate, I suppose. Um, and I, I guess like don't make too, like don't let it get into your head when it comes to things like, oh, I'm in a room with someone who has a vague amount of reputation and therefore I'm going to like try and triangulate my debate strategies in a certain way. Um, it can definitely be very valid. Like it can definitely be valid. Um, especially I've seen like lots of people who um, sometimes misprioritize the way that they respond to things. So like, for instance, you might like respond a lot to someone who um, is clearly like clearly winning where maybe you might be better off kind of trying to place yourself in a better position. And I think that's super valid. Um, it's more of, I think, just like a case by case evaluation of when it's an appropriate strategy to use. I'll add only one thing to that, and that is that you definitely should be aiming to do that. And if, for example, sometimes I find myself with, I can run a Hail Mary argument and do it from closing. And if, we, if it goes well, we're probably taking the first. If it doesn't go well, we're going straight to fourth, baby. Or I could run a safe like, argument that could probably get me second. And I think I could probably get second. But to the end, that like, what is better for a tournament that you will break if you go all second, but it's so much harder to break because like second you get like a fourth or something, it is probably preferable for you to not go for the Hail Mary. Probably wouldn't actually pull off the Hail Mary, but that's another question. But aiming for second is something legitimate 
and almost preferred if like you don't have anything better to do. Awesome. Do we have any more hands? <laughs>